Well, thank you. My name is Salma. I'm a postdoc at the Santa Cruz Institute for Particle Physics. And I will talk to you about the effect of intermediate massive black holes on the gamma ray constraints and dark matter annihilation from local dwarf spheroidal galaxies. And this is a work that I'm doing with Stefano Profumo and Farin Alokios. So why will we think dwarf spheroidal galaxies host intermediate massive black holes? Well, uh, we have a lot of evidence of um, black, massive black holes at very different scales uh, being hosted by galaxies of all different kinds with big, big bulges, bulge, bulgeless galaxies. Uh, these galaxies and all of them from a range uh, from 10 to the 6 to uh, 10 to the 11 solar masses. And we also know of stellar black holes and uh, black holes in global clusters. So it seems that uh, uh, <coughs> there uh, can be something in between. Those are the intermediate massive black holes that I would refer to between 10 to the two solar masses to 10 to the five. And for some time, uh, there was a lack of evidence of uh, intermediate massive black holes. But uh, very recently, uh, there was a sample of five, uh, 150 uh, galaxies with optical evidence of, of, of black holes in the range of 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 6 solar masses. So now it seems that the only galaxies that are not hosting black holes are dwarf spheroidals. And um, that would be the case, or maybe we have just not detected them. And well, there is also uh, some hints of these black holes in dwarf spheroidals. Very questionable, of course, but uh, there are some, in particular for the case of Fornax and Ursa Minor. Uh, in the case of Fornax, there is an upper limit of a black hole of uh, 1.2 uh, 10 to the fifth solar masses, 10 to the fourth solar masses, and for Ursa Minor, it's about the same, 2 to 3 uh, of 10 to the fourth solar masses. And recent searches, recent uh, searches with the XMM, uh, Newton, and Chandra uh, are finding some X-ray sources that uh, are coincident co with the uh, with these two dwarf spheroidals. In the case of Fornax, they cannot uh, give a mass of the black hole because the center of gravity is not well uh, constrained. It seems, seems to be a lot of asymmetry on the uh, stellar surface distribution, and so they cannot give. They can only give a limit on the um, on the accretion efficiency of Fornax that seems to be very low uh, compared to the Eddington uh, limit. And for the case of Ursa Minor, they can do. Uh, they can give. Uh, a minimum mass of the black hole, and it is in the range of 10 to the 4 solar masses to 10 to the 5. So it is a very questionable evidence of uh, intermediate mass black holes in dwarf spheroidals. But then we think uh, it is worth to see what this is going to do for the um, gamma ray limits on dark matter annihilation. So the gamma ray flux uh, expected from dark matter annihilation uh, comes uh, from two factors. One, uh, from the particle physics uh, that basically depends on the cross section, on the annihilation cross section, and the mass of the, par of the dark matter particle, and also the spectrum of photons in which uh, these particles are being annihilated that can be um, fermion bosons or and, uh, and also the other factor is, uh, comes from the astrophysics side. And it 
it is the line of sight of the density of dark matter. So uh, it usually those two factors are uh, very well separated and one uh, can care about their uncertainties uh, separately. However, when there is a black hole present, uh, we're going to see that this astrophysical factor will have a small dependence on the cross section and the mass of the particle. So uh, let me review first what the Fermi constraints are uh, now, and then I will uh, give you the constraints with the black holes. So for the Fermi analysis, of course, given this astrophysical factor, it is important uh, what is the density profile uh, on these dwarf galaxies. And as we have been hearing along the morning, uh, it can be core or cusp. And now uh, we cannot say uh, precisely which one of it is. But uh, for the Fermi analysis, they accounted for this uncertainty by considering two different profiles, the NFW and the Burkert. And the parameters of each of these profiles are consistent with the velocity dispersion of each, uh, of the, of each one of the dwarf spheroidals. And uh, they do a multi-level Bayesian model uh, for these profiles in order to account for the uncertainties on the priors on these parameters, and also for the distance to the dwarfs, and every, every, um, every parameter that needs to, to have a prior, they are also constraining it by uh, this technique. So they, uh, at the end, they find a very um, a well posterior distribution of astrophysical factors that does not depend very much on whether you assume an NFW or a worker. And with this technique, they do um, a joint analysis for uh, 15 of the dwarf spheroidal galaxies. Uh, where they set the particle physics factor, it is common to all of them, and the astrophysical factor was set by uh, this other technique. And they find that their constraints are uh, not very dependent on the density profile as long as it is, uh, as long as the slope is uh, lower that, than 1.2. And so what we are seeing here is because in the Fermi data, they have not detected any source of gamma rays that is coincident with uh, the dwarf spheroidals, then we can put uh, limits on the cross section as a function of the mass of the particle. And those are the current constraints, the, the, the solid black lines. And for the different channels uh, of the final states, of the particles. And in most of the cases, we are very close to prove the annihilation cross-section that gives the correct relic density. And the error bar, the, here the, the, the error bands, comes from the Bayesian analysis that they perform to, uh, to take all the uncertainties into account. So now, what would be the effect of the black hole? If, if, we, if, the, if these intermediate black holes grow adiabatically in the center of the dwarf spheroidals, then uh, that will lead to a formation of a dark matter spike due to adiabatic contraction. Uh, these ideas have been worked for uh, a long time, and it is. Uh, known that the final slope after the adiabatic contraction uh, would be of, of this form in the particular case of uh, starting from an NFW density profile, uh, the final slope will be uh, 7 thirds. And notice that uh, these spikes 
it starts approximately at a, a parsec. So it will, uh, it does not uh, affect uh, the the compatibility with the velocity dispersions or so. And of course, there are many factors that can uh, erase this, uh, erase or at least uh, smooth this dark matter spike that comes from the scatter of the dark matter by stars uh, and the formation of the black hole off center or the major majors. Um, of these dwarf spheroidals. Uh, the first one is, we think, is not uh, very uh, relevant for these dwarf spheroidals due to the uh, low content of uh, stars and gas. And, but the other two can be. So now the astrophysical factor uh, will be calculated by integrating this uh, density profile, but this one is truncated to a maximum scale that is set by uh, the annihilation of the cross-section of the dark matter and the mass of the particle. Uh, this is basically set by the evolution of the density uh, of the dark matter particles. And so to, to now recalculate what will be the constraints on, the, on dark matter annihilation, we have to assign a uh, mass of the black hole to each of the dwarfs. And to do so, we have uh, used three of the uh, known relations for the mass of the black hole with the luminosity or the mass of the black hole with the uh, velocity dispersion. And we use those three because they are enclosing a wide range of masses for the black holes that are appropriate for these uh, dwarf spheroidals. And so this is how uh, our new constraints looks like. Uh, and those are using the, the original Fermi constraints as a base uh, because we have to satisfy the same condition, now uh, we have this implicit equation for the cross section, for, for the annihilating cross section in presence of black hole that we solve uh, iteratively. So we can see that now each, this is constraints for each individual of the galaxies and uh, there are many of the galaxies that if they are hosting a black hole uh, can exclude already the region of the relic uh, that, is that gives the appropriate relic density. Uh, this, this panel is when I assume the mass uh, sigma, the three main relation, and here it is the Magorian relation. So, uh, we can see that those two galaxies that uh, do have some hints on, of, of black holes on it, uh, are given very strong constraints, and actually they like uh, f f uh, interchange between them when uh, we uh, change the recipe for the mass. But in any case, both of them will be very uh, putting very strong constraints on on the dark matter annihilation. We did the same thing for the Burkert profile, and in this case, the constraints are. Uh, also more are stronger, but not not as much as with the NFW that was uh, um, expected, of course. So, in general, uh, we can be uh, much more constraining than without the black hole, of course. But it highly depends on how do you assign. Uh, the mass to each of the dwarf spheroidals. So we uh, try to, to combine all the galaxies as uh, the Fermi collaboration did. And this is what we find for the different uh, recipes of the mass of the black hole. And what, uh, what it is interesting is that we only need a mass of 100 solar masses of or fifth uh, in the case of a Burkert profile 
or a mass of 50 solar masses for the NFW profile <coughs> to be uh, outside of the current Fermi um, constraints. So even if this uh, recipe that we put is unrealistic because we are not taking into account the effect of uh, from the black hole off center or um, or the interaction with the stars, uh, it is possible that uh, those the presence of the black holes in at least in Fornax and Ursa Minor can uh, give more strong constraints than uh, Fermi collaboration is currently considering. And we do also, do also the same for other annihilation channels. What I presented was for the uh, bottom quarks in the final state, and it, this is for uh, W uh, bosons and tau tau. And also would be very constrained by the same means. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, this is Westcliff Drive. Yeah, that's uh, right. My, my favorite place. <laughs> it is my favorite place. And but you're not living there, isn't it? No, no, that's my that's why it is my favorite. <laughs> yeah. So thank you very much. We have maybe time for one or two questions. Should be worth that not only you know how steep the gas is. I think a principle uh, could go the other way. I think the only galaxies that really know that the black holes are massive elliptical, we actually think that on the collisional stars it has the opposite effect because uh, we think they are binaries that actually scatter out the uh, collisional, collisionless particles. So we think that in the elliptical, we actually produce a large core by having a black hole in it because occasionally you will have a binary that actually kicks out all the stars. So it could actually go the other way, but instead of having a cusp, we actually have less dark matter if you have more mm -hmm. than one black hole. Yeah, but in this dwarf spheroidals, we don't have so much stars, I guess. So thank you very much. Now, uh, now